Thank you. Good to kick me. Uh, so we return to the public session of the Governance Audit Committee. Uh, we're on agenda item three, which are the minutes of the previous meeting, which was held on the 3rd of June. A couple of, of uh, corrections for accuracy. Uh, the first set of people listed in the presence are MV and C Prosser, and it says councillors in front of them. Thank you for the elevation, but we're not. And Joan Davis has also been elevated or demoted. Take your pick from, uh, she's been moved in the Audit Wales list, which should, of course, be in the Regional Internal Audit Service list. I don't know whether you can argue amongst yourselves whether that's a promotion or a relegation. Uh, any other issues with the minutes? Okay. Agenda item four is the action log. If I turn to Helen to introduce, introduce and she will seek updates from wherever she needs to seek them. Helen. Thank you, Chair. So the action log on page nine, uh, you can see from the table, there are five actions that remain on the log as outstanding. Um, I'll just quickly go through them. So action point one and three, these will be updated following today's meeting because we update in retrospect. Action two, this will require further discussions with relevant officers. Action point four, um, just bear with me a second. Action point four, uh, this is where it was requested the security and access to council buildings, a written update was going to be provided. But I think on this occasion, Alice is going to give us an update, please. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. Thank, thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, so just to update members, um, unfortunately, um, Liam Hull was uh, has run out of time in terms of completing this report. In fairness, he did try to uh, have a good go of finishing it, but uh, he required some other additional officers to complete that information for him. Obviously, he was trying to concentrate on um, well, sorting out finance issues before he left. So what I've agreed um, with the chair, uh, if committee are happy, is that we'll complete um, that report, but rather than wait till September, as soon as we've completed it, we'll circulate to the members as soon as we can. It shouldn't take very long. So hopefully within a week or two, just getting some additional updates from services, we can complete that and circulate to you. Thank you, it's really helpful. Helen, still with you. Thank you. And finally, at action point five, the head of the Regional Internal Audit Service is to provide an explanation as to why only 18 questionnaires were sent out post audit when 25 were finalised in 23-24. So if I pass you on to Andrew Wall then, please. Thanks, Helen. Yeah, members quite rightly uh, challenged us this on this when we presented our annual reports last time round. Um, we did finalise 25 audits in the year. Um, and there was a question around why we only sent out 18 questionnaires. Some of that was around timing, so that there was a delay in the final report being sent out late in the year, which we wouldn't have captured the statistics, unfortunately. Um, one or two actually slipped through the net and the questionnaire wasn't sent out, but we've now re re um, reviewed that situation and made sure that all finalised audits in 23-24 have subsequently been sent a post audit questionnaire. Um, that's for 23-24. So we've, we were waiting for a response on some of those, Chair. Um, but moving forward, Helen is now on the case across the whole of the regional service to make sure that when we finalise reports, everybody receives a post audit questionnaire. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. It's, it's helpful intelligence in terms of continuing to improve the, the service. Sorry, Helen, I didn't catch if you mentioned when we talked about item one on that list, the training development day. At one point we were, sorry, my phone, my bad. Uh, at one point we were talking about potentially even cancelling September's governance audit committee and having the training session in that slot. I think looking at the forward work plan, there's a lot of stuff on in September. So rather than do that, we're going to find an appropriate slot. So. Helen, in conjunction with Democratic Services, will be canvassing for dates either middle, late September or into October, I guess, to find dates we can all be available to do an in-person training session here in the building. Okay, thank you. Um, we move on now to agenda item five, which is the Audit Wales annual plan. I have both Alice and uh, Sarah Jane in attendance today. It looks like Alice is primed to go first, Alice. I'm just checking that out. You can hear me because Sue was having yep. problems. Yeah, no problem. We got it. Ah, excellent. I was slightly panicking. I was going to have to present that whole plan via the chat, and that wasn't going to go quite very quiet, well. Though. 
Oh, am I? Okay. Um, is that any better? Not really, but I think we can just about hear you. Okay. We'll, we'll all be uh, quiet. <laughs> okay. Um, so thank you very much, uh, Chair, for passing this over. Uh, me and Sarah Jane will be doing a bit of a double act for you today. So I'll present financial audit element to the plan, and then I'll hand over to Sarah Jane to uh, present the performance audit aspects. Uh, we won't be presenting every single bullet point on the plan. Um, is that better? <laughs> Good for thumbs up. But we um, will take you through the key elements that we, we've included, uh, but we are, we'll take any questions on anything included in the plan at the end. So this is the audit plan that we present to the Governance Audit Committee every year. Uh, and this will cover the 23-24 audit year. So the 23-24 financial statements and the performance audit work undertaken in 23-24. No, sorry, Sarah Jane's going to correct me, 24-25. <laughs> um, so we have compiled this plan after doing our um, initial audit planning work and we'll present the key uh, risks that we've identified through that work that we completed over the spring and in the early summer. So I'm going to start uh, on page, scroll down to the pack page for you, um, on page 18 of the report pack, and I'm going to start here with materiality. You'll all be familiar now with the concept of materiality, but I just thought I'd include it in here to remind you. So materiality at this planning stage of our audit work is 2.5 million, and that is estimated, uh, estimated using last year's gross expenditure. We'll obviously update that when we have the final set of accounts for 23-24. There are, as always, some elements that we apply a lower level of materiality uh, as they are considered areas of specific interest for the user of the accounts. So this year, similarly to last year, we've identified key areas to be senior officer salary benefits and compensation. So we've set that level this year to be £5,000. And then related party disclosures, with transactions between the council and officers or elected members and their um, related parties to be £10,000. And then any tra transactions with companies associated with Merthyrville to be normal materiality of 2.5 million. Moving on then, we uh, have captured it on page 19, the significant risk that we've identified um, through our planning work for Merthyrville. So the first risk here is around management override. So we always have to consider the risk of management overriding the controls present in the entity, and we are not able to rebut that risk. So you'll see this risk every year on each of your audit plans. So this risk hasn't changed this year, and neither has our planned response to that risk that um, yeah we can't rebut. A new significant risk for this year is um, a risk arising from the amount of turnover in the finance team at Merthyr Tidwell in the last year. Uh, th this includes turnover in staff at key positions, such as di uh, Director of Finance, Section 151 role, and then the team that sit beneath him. We see this as a significant risk because it potentially um, will impact multiple areas of the account and um, arises due to basically lack of experience uh, uh, of the of the council, uh, their processes and the nature of any other risks that are, are present at Merthyr Tidville. And uh, we've presented that as significant risk because of that possibility of that risk extending across the accounts. So we've got some planned responses in there. This will include maintaining regular dialogue with the finance team, which I'm glad to say we already have done throughout the year, but to continue that through the accounts preparation process to identify any areas where there might be likely misstatement. To evaluate the draft accounts and any supporting working papers, working papers, sorry, to assess the quality of those um, drafts and papers to make sure they're as expected. And also to um, take a step back and assess the appropriate level of audit work that we will need to undertake based on this risk being present. We're still in the process of assessing what that might look like for, for the council, um, and we're waiting to receive the draft accounts to be able to complete that work. Moving on then, we've got some other areas of audit focus. So these are still risks of material misstatement for the council, but we have not deemed them to be significant. So firstly, on page 20, we've got the valuation of the pension fund net liability. 
So this uh, is a risk uh, that we see um, as potentially resulting in a material misstatement as it, uh, the pension fund is uh, undertaken via estimates. Uh, these are significant estimates. They're potentially subjective and they're com uh, very complicated calculations that are undertaken by the actuary on your behalf. Uh, there are also uh, economic conditions that we need to consider and several legal cases that uh, might result in uh, amendments needing to be required. Uh, I've listed there our planned responses. I won't go through those in detail because they haven't changed from the risk that was there last year. Very similarly, we've got the valuation of land and buildings. So again, the valuation of your land and buildings is complicated. It's based on estimates and it is subjective. So it presents a significant, uh, sorry, a risk to the council of misstatement. Your assets are revalued on a, a cyclical basis, so all assets are revalued every five years, but there's also a risk that any assets that aren't revalued might have significantly or materially changed in value in that time. So we have to consider that uh, as part of our audit work as well. Finally, the uh, accounting adjustments for these revaluations are very complex and we see uh, any potential errors resulting in a material misstatement due to the large values of uh, revaluations that we're expecting. Again, we've got our planned responses there in the column uh, to the right. Uh, these responses haven't changed this year as well. The next two risks I'll just take together. These are the senior risk for senior officer remuneration and related party transactions. We've included these as a risk this year because of that lower level of materiality means that any misstatements are more likely to be material because the level is so low. So we've included them here for your information with the planned response as well. And finally, we've got a risk around leases and capital commitments. I presented it to this committee our recommendations a couple of uh, meetings ago uh, due to significant number of issues we found when we audited these last year, these areas in the accounts. So we've put this as a risk as potentially being a mis material misstatement again this year because we found so many errors last year. So we'll be working closely with the um, council and the finance team to make sure those misstatements aren't repeated again in the draft accounts for this year. So moving on now to the financial statements um, audit timetable. So that is on page 23. Uh, we have included in here the audit plan, which we'll be presenting to you today. So our audit planning work, although ongoing, is largely complete now. The audit of the financial statements, we have planned to undertake this between November and February 2025. Uh, I'm going to kind of preempt the questions that I might get on this. So uh, we wrote out to all authorities uh, earlier in the year outlining that we could only guarantee to complete our audit work by the 30th of November statutory deadline if we received the draft account and all complete supporting working papers by the 30th of June. Unfortunately, given the circumstances at the Council, which I'm well aware of and, and you will be as well with the turnover and staff uh, and the difficulties that's presented this year, the finance team weren't able to provide us with draft accounts um by that deadline so unfortunately that means that the work will have to commence um once we've completed the audit work of those authorities where their um, accounts were received by the deadline so we're planning to undertake that work as i said there between november and february and hopefully uh, we'll be have a report finalized by february 2025 to present to this committee finally on the timetable we've got our other grant certification work which includes housing benefit non-domestic rates and teachers pension and we'll be undertaking that work between December and March 25. So at that point I will pass over to Sarah Jane who will talk you through the performance audit work. Okay thanks Alice can you hear me okay because I know there were some issues earlier everyone can hear me okay brilliant um, yeah so I'm Sarah Jane Byrne I'm the audit manager that looks after the performance audit side so I'll just talk you through briefly what's in the audit plan and your pack on page 24 so we do this work to discharge our duties related to proper arrangements and also the sustainable development principle which were outlined earlier in the plan on page 16. Hopefully you'll be familiar with the process that we do every year now, which is around, which we call our assurance and risk assessment kind of process. So as it says there, that's really our opportunity to look at a, a, a wide range of arrangements and services to help us determine where we focus our work, to help us determine, you know, to fulfill our duties, as I just mentioned. Um, we will, um, one of the areas that we will be keeping an eye on is um, the council's progress with its leisure services following the handover and um, back from the 
accredited for Wellbeing Leisure Trust. But that is work that we'll do throughout the whole year. So we have regular meetings with the council, so we'll get updates on that. Um, then we've got two local pieces of work, one of which will be on counter fraud. Now, this is in part to follow up the national piece of work that was done a few years ago, but we, we also um, reported to the council a couple of years ago in terms of progress and there are a few areas that we wanted to get some updates on. And then the other local piece of work is around risk management. Um, we haven't done a fundamental review of risk management for some time, so I wanted to get some assurance around that. We haven't yet determined the exact scope of those pieces of work or the timescales, but we'll be in discussion with the council as to when and we'll keep you posted. Um, through our work programme timetable updates, which we bring to um, the audit committee. Um, before I hand back to Alice, I just wanted to just draw your attention to the, um, the bits at the end of the audit plan, which gives you some assurance in terms of how we go about making sure that our, word, our work meets you know, various audit quality standards and also other things that we do, for example, through our good practice exchange team and how you can find more information about the, the work we do. So you can sign up to the newsletter and things like that. So I just wanted to make you aware of that, but I'll, I'll just hand back to Alice because I know she wanted to cover off some aspects of the fee and then we're happy to take any questions. Thanks, Alice. Yeah, thanks, Sarah Jane. So uh, I'm gonna skip now um, on to page 26, um, which takes you through the fee and our audit team for the year. Uh, so the fee there is um, in total £362,406. That is a 6.4% um, increase. Just to draw your attention to the grant certification work, um, which is uh, footnote number five, uh, there is a slight higher increase than 6.4%. I don't have the figure to hand, sorry, uh, because we found uh, a number of issues with the housing benefit return this year. Uh, the work's just been completed on that this week. And so we had to reflect that in a slightly higher fee than we were anticipating uh, for this year. So just wanted to draw your attention to, to that. I also uh, wanted to highlight fee based on having a good quality set of accounts um, and uh, no issues in the account and good quality working papers. So based on the significant risks that I outlined over earlier in our report, if we do find issues because of the turnover in finance staff, which hopefully we won't, we may have to increase the amount of work we're doing to gain assurance over your accounts and that will reflect in potentially higher audit fees for you. So I did just want to highlight that little box that we've got on that page, which, um, which sets that out. Finally, just dropping down onto page 27, um, we have had some changes in the engagement team this year. I'm sure you've already heard this, but I just wanted to double check. We have had a change in engagement director. So the, the engagement director role is being taken over by Gareth Lucy. He's already been in uh, meetings with, um, with Ellis and with Liam before he left. So um, I think he took over earlier in the year, but I just wanted to flag in case um, you weren't aware. And then finally, um, Matt Brachette has taken over as the performance audit lead from Ian. Um, again, Matt's been uh, in touch, I think, with officers in the council um, and will be taking over that work um, immediately, I believe, Sarah Jane. Yeah. So I just wanted to, to highlight those changes in case you see some new faces coming and presenting to you. So I know there's a lot in there, that uh, paper. So I'm more than happy to take any questions. I know I'm back to you, Chair. Thank you, Alice. Thank you, Sarah Jane. That's really helpful. Before we get into the detailed report, it's probably appropriate to turn to uh, Alice Cooper just to talk about the accounts timetable, delivery of the draft accounts, and general staffing issues, and particularly around the Section 151 officer. Alice. Yeah, sorry. So, um, thank you, uh, colleagues from Audit Wales. Yeah, so we uh, we we are fully aware of the uh, challenges we've been experiencing and in, uh, in terms of turnover. So, um, I can uh, uh, happily say that we managed to appoint a new uh, Section 151 uh, at the end of last week. Um, so, Craig Flynn will uh, be hopefully be joining us. Um, once he serves his notice period in his current uh, role. Um, and in the interim, in terms of uh, cover, um, we have um, a report going to Council on Wednesday uh, for uh, commissioning cover from Ron the Cunning Taff um, in respect of having Bar Barry Davis acting as our uh, 151 and Stephanie Davis, no relation, I believe, as a Deputy 151 um, for a four month period. And so even if uh, Craig has completed his uh, notice period in time, there will be a, a time for a handover period uh, from Rhonda and Taff 
um, to uh, create a gazillion come in uh, section 151. Um, obviously, the, uh, you mentioned in terms of uh, stability, the next thing we want to look at now is the our internal um, uh, head of account slash deputy 151 role. We look to appoint um, to that, but obviously that's a discussion I do want to have with Craig and Barry as well, uh, assuming uh, council approve the position on, on Wednesday. Um, in respect to the the um, timelines, obviously, yeah, given our turnover and capacity challenges, there is no way we're going to meet that uh, initial deadline, unfortunately. And we totally understand that, and the pressure be on, uh, you know, even though that we won't get it until February, but there is nothing we can do with regards to that, unfortunately. Um, yeah, happy to take any questions from uh, a Merthyr side, if there are any. Just to follow up on that, then, um, I, I'm presuming reading between the lines that we didn't deliver a set of draft accounts by the end of June. Is there a is there a, a date in anyone's mind as to when we do hand the draft set of accounts to uh, Audit Wales? I'll have to come back to you, unfortunately, Chair, because obviously um, I don't know when um, we are going to have that ready by, unfortunately. Okay, it would be great great if you could keep this committee posted, obviously, because some of the gen the um, meeting schedule of this committee is sort of predicated upon accounts, etc. The one thing we might well do is uncouple the annual governance statement and receive that in September, even if the accounts aren't ready to, ready to receive, because it's a very, very big document otherwise. So perhaps we can receive the written bit, even if we don't get the numbers bit. I think that might might work well. OK, thank you. Um, can I, before we turn over to, quest, to questions, I, I, I'll go through the document in, in uh, as, as you did, Alice, very thoroughly. Um, on page Sorry, on page 15 of the bundle, it says, I have now largely completed my planning work. Does that mean you have finished your planning work? Or, or is it an ongoing process so you never complete it? <laughs> it is a bit of an ongoing process. We've completed a large amount of the planning work before we issued you with this plan, but there are still some elements that we want to wrap up. Also, given the fact that the audit will be going that much later, we have to keep that planning process ongoing until we start the final audit. So that that's why that statement's in there as well. OK, it feels like a sort of cover all about that. OK, <laughs> can I turn to the significant risks? Um, you mentioned specifically the risk about the finance team, and that's, uh, if not unique to Merthyr, then specific in this audit plan because of staffing issues within the finance team. The remaining audit uh, risks that you've identified in there and the ones on the next page with the other areas of focus, are they all standard across all organisations or are some of them specifically flagged because of Merthyr? Uh, they are um, especially things like the pension and the asset valuations. They, I can't confirm that they've been on every audit plan that have gone to organisations, but they are um, risks that will be apparent in all, all councils, um, given the nature of those risks. Um, similarly, with senior officer and related parties, that depends on where uh, materiality has been lowered to that um, lower level. Um, so here for, for Merthyr, that, that's obviously what I've explained earlier in the paper. The bottom one about leases and, and capital commitments, that is specific to Merthyr due to the issues that we identified when we completed the audit work last year. So, um, yeah. Thank you, Alice. That's, that, that, Alice, that's really helpful. Um, I, could, I, could, I could go on, and I, th I think I probably will, because I'm looking around the room for hands. I don't see any. <laughs> <laughs> the, the timetable for this year, obviously, is uh, extended into February 25. I recall uh, the Audit Wales letter talking about the stage plan to recover back to a normal timetable. What will 20 or the following year's audit look like? In terms I of think it. Yeah, sorry for cutting your question there. Um, the it is very dependent on us receiving a good quality set of accounts and working papers on time and what that looks like next year, I can't say. Uh, we've obviously issued a recovery plan um, in our letter wanting to bring the dates progressively forward over the next three years, and we will continue to look to do that, which will bring that deadline back to the 30th of September. But obviously where councils have particular issues or they're not able to produce those drafts by that deadline of the 30th of June, we're not going to be able to commit to doing those in that recovery period. So it is kind of dependent, it's a bit chicken and egg, I'm afraid, on whether the uh, the accounts come in on time. OK, that, 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 that's under understandable. OK, thank you very much. And the last one from me, as you know, this is coming, page 26, the fee. Mm -hmm. It's now astonishingly over a third of a million pounds. It's an astonishing number. 
8.1% increase overall. And I hear what you're saying about grant certification work being the biggest chunk of that. Um, but I still feel it's it's given the last year's fee, it went up by something like 15%. This, <laughs> which you don't mention in this report, um, it, it feels against the backdrop of inflation being at 2%. It's the 6.4% is feels astonishingly tenured, frankly. The, the residents of Merthyr are suffering real terms cuts and there's not a hint of discussion in here about both how you're being more efficient, how you're trying to reduce that figure. Uh, 6.4 6 would be bad, 8.1 is even worse. And uh, it, it's really disappointing. And it's 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 got nothing about the quality of the work and nothing about the timeliness of the work, but the, 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 the extraordinary cost, how it's gone up by many tens of thousands in recent years is just amazing. It's a yeah, comment. You... I don't know. I don't necessarily think you can answer it, Alice. I I, I think it's it's fully across audit Wales, but it's not helpful that there's no acknowledgement of how you're trying to be more efficient to keep costs down. Uh, yeah, I, I... Thing... Oh. <laughs> sorry, on, sorry, 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 sorry. I was going to say I think um, the Auditor General has explained in our when we do our fee consultation all the work that we're doing to try to cut our costs in terms of moving to smaller offices, all of those kind of things in the same way all public sector organisations are doing and the pressures that we're facing, similar to others as well. So please be assured it's not that we're not trying to do much of that. So I'd be more than happy to share information around that with you out of committee as well, so we can point you to that. And I think um, more specifically, you mentioned the increase last year. I think we were very upfront with that was due to the change in the auditing standard, um, the implementation of ISA 315. We're still working through those changes this year and what that means for our approach in the second cycle, learning lessons from last year. So although there is another uh, increase this year, it's with that backdrop of such a significant change to our approach in the prior year and are still feeling the effects of that and the knock on that that has onto our recruitment and also our retention, which is similar with finance staff across the profession. So we have to make sure that we are recruiting, retaining highly qualified staff to be able to deliver really important, high quality audit work. Mm -hmm. And I think the, the final point I just want to make, um, Martin, is that if you go to the letter that we sent out outlining the audit timetable and the executive director Anne Marie Harkin sent out, there's a really useful comparison of the rate in England compared to across the border. And I hope that that will um, ensure that you feel that you're getting value for money because it shows how much lower our rates are compared to across the border uh, in quite stark terms. Yeah, I've already raised that with Anne Marie. I think it's a, dis <laughs> a completely dis disingenuous comparison compared to private firms in England when we really should be comparing with Scotland, but nevertheless, that's the point. My, my general summary is I, I'd expect this to flatline next year. I mean, Merthyr's budget's going to flatline next year. I mean, I don't know where the money's coming from. Should we should we not have education, but we have audit? It seems it's, it feels feels wrong. There we are. That's my two penneth. I'll breathe and pause, pause for any other comments. I think I've covered most of the bases here. Um, but if anyone's got any other issues, okay, I don't know. One, no, nobody else. I think I've covered most of it. Thank you, guys. It's it's a really helpful to understand where we are. Um, whilst the accounts are a long way away, if we get regular updates on where we are as, as a committee, we'll be we'll we'll be grateful to receive that assurance. So thank you, guys. We'll we'll continue to see you guys, and we might even see uh, Gary as well at some point in the future. Gareth, rather, in some time in the future as well. Thank you. Let's go on to agenda item six, which is the quarterly update on corporate risks. And it says uh, Liam Hull on here, but I suspect it's been delegated upwards to the chief executive. Ellis. You are correct, yeah. So I'll take that if that's okay. Um, so, remember, it's a very straightforward report. It's just a, a Q4 update in terms of risks. So, if I just jump back to section four, um, where we were. So, at the end of Q3, um, we saw risks related to capacity, both in terms of losing staff and skills and capacity, and an inability to recruit and retain staff uh, had increased. Very timely, considering what we just discussed. Um, these changes are due to the financial challenges the council uh, faces and the number of staff due to leave the organisation through uh, VER uh, as part of the 24-25 budget setting process. In 4.2, conversely, um, town centre safety had been reduced due to the introduction of town, uh, town wardens and the decommission of temporary accommodation uh, with the introduction of Marsh House coming into being. Um, and these actions led to corporate management team uh, reducing the score to 12. 
Uh, 4.3, an emerging risk was also identified within social services and the risk is regarding elimination of profit in children's services by Welsh Government bringing in new legislation. So in uh, the table under uh, section 5.1, um, this gives a position in terms of where uh, we are now. So if I just draw your attention to the four risks uh, that have decreased uh, in there. So capacity one, uh, which is the risk that the council loses staff with the skills and capacity to deliver on key outcomes and targets. That is something we were significantly concerned about trying to set the budget because we thought we were going to lose a lot of staff. Um, fortunately, when we did set the budget, 24-25 budget was balanced without the need to reduce major staff numbers uh, as we previously anticipated. So we reduced that risk at the end of Q4 down to 16. Um, environmental one, uh, which is the risk that the council fails to become net zero by 2030. So we've also reduced, reduced that from 16 down to 12. Um, so the reassessment, the specific impact of the authority in the council fails reassessment of specific impact on the authority if the council fails to meet this target so the with the i'll come on to that in terms of the aap report but a, a significant number of actions have been undertaken in terms of uh toward going stepping towards uh, net zero which i'll update in the next report if that's okay because i've got a detailed update on that um, schools three, which is the risk of increasing costs for home to school transport um, and contract operators not fulfilling their contracts, that reduced down to 15. So we were con significantly concerned some of the operators were going to uh, drop out of their contract, but that didn't happen. Um, and we were able to maintain those contracts at the, at the, the current let budget, uh, and that was budgeted for, so it was reduced the risk at the end of Q4. Um, similarly then, with ALN support in schools uh, four, um, uh, yeah, it's written wrong, apologies, schools four um, risk, which is the risk of increased demand for ALN support and increasing costs of home to school transport for ALN pupils. Similarly, the contracts weren't dropped out from and uh, they were maintained and the, but all the costs have been budgeted for. We, so we simply reduced that risk down to 12 as a delivery. And essentially, um, Chair and members, that is that report in a nutshell. Um, the rest of the uh, risk um, profiles are in the appendix, uh, appendix one. Um, but I think other than what the four that I've gone through, the rest are static and have remained the same. Thank you, Alice. That's really, really helpful to understand the, the major, the major movers. Um, this is Q4 for last year, which I guess is as at March, early April time when it was last reviewed. Any emerging stuff since then? Any things that likely be going up or down? Um, at this time, um, obviously we've we are still um, looking at the. Uh, um, sorry, Jane Byrne mentioned the, the Leisure Trust. Obviously, those services coming back, we're trying to get to grips with um, the um, runners and riders in terms of those service provision. Um, uh, so nothing at this stage, but it may have a knock on it, impact to wider risks, but we need to assess that. Um, the ongoing um, staffing and retention is still a challenge at the moment. Um, obviously, recruitment and uh, recruitment challenge has been significant, but we're trying to address that. Uh, certain areas are still suffering in terms of being able to attract uh, relevant staff. Um, but Touchwood, I don't think we've had um, a major. Uh, we're not we're not losing um, a big turnover turnover of staff uh, across the organisation at this moment in time. So that's really helpful. Th thank you. Um, the only one that strikes strikes me as, as something which is emerging and you know the, the issue that you're dealing with right now is the reintegration i guess or the taking over of the of some of the with the didville leisure trust uh services um i presume that's going to be covered by an appropriate scrutiny committee but i guess you don't have a leisure and library scrutiny committee because you didn't have the you got rid of the services <laughs> yeah so um it, it's coming under um scrutiny at the moment is coming under um Regeneration, I believe, is the, in terms of take back of the services. Uh, however, obviously, because uh, libraries and uh, museums have gone under education, it's whether um, that uh, scrutiny committee also look at those parts of the service coming back. But in terms of the, the leisure provision aspect, it's under uh, regeneration to start with. Okay, just to, 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 it's not for this committee. It's just to make sure that somewhere in the in the in the council, somebody's keeping an eye on that. On that, absolutely. Okay, thank you, thank you. Any questions for Alice? 
Okay. <laughs> Lots of who's struggling. Okay. Um, we'll therefore move on to agenda item seven, and we're staying we're staying with you, Alice, which is the external audit recommendations and progress against. Okay, so the our audit action plan system um, was created in terms of looking at uh, improved oversight for corporate management team uh, of both internal and external audits, um, and making sure that that you know the I and I whether I is kept on any audit recommendations to be completed um, and and implemented. So we've. Unfortunately, yeah, it is mentioned in the report as well in terms of uh, staff related matters. So we've had again some turnover here. Um, so if I just bring members to um, uh, the current position. So in 4.3, it's understood the exercise to close historic recommendation and proposals from uh, the period 20, 2014 to 15 to 2019 20 is complete. So wherever we can, that we had a long, long list on our AAP system. So we're trying to clear out the decks basically of anything that's already completed. And we, we're currently using a BRAG status, which we refer to in 4.4. Yep. BRAG, all, all, all the B is in the RAG status is blue for complete. Yep. Uh, on top of the rag. So it's a Mirtha implementation, which other people use as well, but yeah, it's for yeah. clarity. Um, so, so we're trying to get clear out as much as we can from a, a, an oversight perspective, uh, so we can yeah. concentrate on the things that are still um, outstanding. So in section five, so um, 5.1, verification that any outstanding recommendations dating back as far as 2014, 15 are closed down the council audit action plan. Um, Continuation of desktop exercise of updating BRAG states is until completion. And then I draw everybody's attention to 5.5, .5, following confirmation of any structural staffing changes, further cl clarification on the, on the position in relation to monitoring the progress of AAP entries to be confirmed. So as I mentioned, we've had some turnover of staff. Um, uh, obviously, obviously, members will remember Matthew Rivers moved on and as did uh, SAFE. Um, so we've we've had some turnover. So the AAP system has passed hands a couple of times, but um, we've hopefully stabilised that now. And we are currently out to recruitment for a director of governance. So obviously, the governance of this uh, would be something that would fall uh, under that director to champion and look at. And within that, then there'd be a policy and performance manager uh, role, which we're looking to uh, fill as well, um, which gives us then some capacity to regularise the oversight of this uh, set of functions in line with everything else we've just been talking about, really. So really trying to strengthen our governance position uh, going forward. So if I can just, uh, obviously the the appendices covers the existing full um, AAP um, or setup as it is. Um, so it's fairly wide ranging. So going back to um, any outstanding uh, or audits but also it's got this this actually has in it something that are also 100 percent complete yeah. on the update but i've had some further updates from uh, directors which were, were done after this report was completed actually so which I'm, I'm happy to go through if you so wish now chair um but if i just mention uh, in terms of the net zero uh, ambition which i um just referred to in the previous report so um, recommendation one, in order to meet this net zero ambition, the council needs to fully cost its action plan and ensure that it's aligned with this medium term financial plan. So we remain on target to cost the plan by the end of July 24. Most of the actions are cost neutral as being uh, constant available budgets. They just involve staff time. Um, an e-learning module and um, on decarbonisation was launched in January 24, and to date over 700 staff have completed the training module. Training to deliver the module face-to-face uh, -to, -face, uh, to frontline staff has commenced in July 24 as well. Um, and another update is the Council achieved the Bronze Award on the One Planet standard in June 24. The standard has provided a, stro provided a stro strong framework to enhance the level of engagement on climate change throughout the organisation. The Council is now working towards achieving the Silver Award. So that, that's just material updates in terms of going back to my comment yeah. earlier in terms of net zero. Um, there are a couple of up other updates which I'm more than happy to go through, but they are numerous and varied. Um, do you want me to do that, Chair, or not? Let <clears throat> What I was going to say, uh, uh, Ellis, I think it's a helpful report to understand where we are, and the right-hand column is really key to it all, isn't it, in terms of how close we are to completion. Some of them are 90%, which is tantalisingly close to being completed, and a few of them are marked as 100% complete. And I assume if we are happy, we will agree for those to be marked as complete and disappear off this list. Um, I think probably, since this is a work in progress, I think 
this it comes back with those updates and any more updates next time, I guess. And we'll keep it on. We'll keep it as a live issue for us to be dealing with. Uh, and, and as as the list hopefully goes down as other things get done or get overtaken by events and disappear off the, the list for another reason. I think that, that, that's, that's probably, that's probably that's Yeah, chair. If you want to, make, if, I mean, we can. If we if we take it as an ongoing update yeah. continually to um, every meeting, even that's a, by exception, say okay, we've completed this and yeah. um, and then still have a regular eye on terms of right that's getting overdue now. I mean, for for me, this is a system for corporate management team to to own it and manage it, and it's just we've been hit by a couple of resource issues to do that, but it is something we look at now um, on a regular basis. So hopefully, with a couple of couple of people to update some reports, those will be cleared off as well. Yeah. Terrific. I think that's a, that, I think that's a, a sensible way forward. We can keep an eye on keep an eye on things as a, as a committee. Then, okay. Any specific questions for the chief exec on anything else in this agenda? Uh, Colin, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to uh, just touch on the uh, on the digital strategy. Um, it, just that uh, obviously uh, audit, audit Wales have done their thematic on it. Um, it's, it's an issue for all councils, and a, a lot of councils have issue, you know, identified issues around around the strategy. Um, and I was just wondering if, if there was potential, because going forward, everybody's looking at AI, and then there may be substantial cost savings across the council, and whether there could be a collaborative approach to that, um, possibly through the Cardiff City deal. Um, because I, I know that they're doing things with digital, but if they, if they did something that was a potential silver bullet in a, uh, such as say round engagement or something like that, um, which you know could um, could could reduce or remove cost for us. Yeah, no, absolutely. So, um, so from just to touch on the the digital strategy to start with. So, what what we're looking at doing in terms of our budget set and approach, we've got a number of cross cutting themes. One of which will be digital, where each via directorate, each service. Um, will be given a set of challenges um, across what we are considering the key levers to pull in terms of budget setting. So digital process, um, personnel, um, commercial uh, and contracting. Um, so looking at the digital uh, engagement aspect for each service, we would look at a key set of questions to, for service managers to ask themselves and their service, OK, uh, what, what is my position against these set of criteria and what are the opportunities we can look at? We're going to very much, given the challenge of resources, we're going to take an 80-20 rule or Pareto's law um, where we look at where we get the biggest bang for our buck, we'll concentrate our resources accordingly. And that's both in terms of um, time, in terms of capacity, but equally, I would have thought an investment as well. Because if we do manage to scrape any investment together in terms of looking at new technology, we've got to make sure the business case does pay off. Um, so. Having said that, though, given the current uh, advent of AI at the moment, there's a lot of low cost, no cost options where we can look at process improvement. Um, the challenge for the authority is how we actually tease actual cost savings out of that. We'll get an efficiency bump, which is desperately needed. And I think it's going to be more a case of initial cost offset to start with rather than huge savings from implementing new technology. But I'm open minded at this point. If there are some big ticket items we can craft business cases for with a significant saving, then we'll go after that all day long. Um, the city deal engagement. Um, yeah, obviously, we we'll continue um, dialogue with city deal. Um, I know not via city deal, but there are um, potential initiatives looking at Microsoft's uh, version of um, ChatGPT. Um, I forget, I've forgotten his name now. I do forget. I apologise. Um, where because we've got existing Microsoft licensing, there are opportunities we can look at that corporately as uh, other authorities. So uh, Monmouth, I believe, has uh, made some savings in respect of the use of that software. So where where we can learn from fellow authorities, we do that anyway. And again, that is part of the service challenge we look into uh, draw out in a digital strategy, where there's service opportunities. Uh, found in other authorities, we're going to again see what we can implement from a Merthyr perspective. But um, I'm hoping by the end of the summer, through the series of exercises we're going to do, um, we'll have teased out all the opportunities right across the authority in order to essentially write our digital strategy from a, a base up perspective quite quickly. Just the one thing to, to, to mention with uh, AI. Which I always think is interesting because we've got AI as well, we've got actual intelligence. 
And I think that uh, the one thing just to just flag, you mentioned Microsoft, and that would be okay if it's within Microsoft because they already have rules about GDPR, et cetera. If we start picking something off the cloud and sending confidential information for them to write a report or to do some analysis on, there's a risk that information disappears somewhere where it shouldn't go. So I'm sure we're on the case on it. Uh, absolutely, Chair. That's, that's part of the reason why we, we are very cautious in terms of using ChatGPT. So it's restricted at the moment within the authority. Um, so... Yeah, very much that issue in terms of you've got to know how to use it and where data storage happens. Um, so yeah, that, that's why the the Microsoft um, I forgot where the solution is called. The Microsoft solution is potentially on site, therefore we may be able to use that. Great, thank thank you. Perfect answer. <laughs> um, if there's nothing else for Chief Executive on external audio recognition, we'll turn to agenda item eight which is the annual corporate Ford report. And we'll turn to Joan Davis, who's with us in person for the first time. She's <laughs> online last time. Joan, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Joan Davis, Deputy Head of the Regional Internal Audit Service. Agenda item eight is our annual corporate Ford report, which provides members of this committee with details of the actions undertaken in respect of counter fraud during 23-24. There is a fraud officer appointed by Merthyr Council, but management support to this post is, and oversight is provided by the Regional Internal Audit Service. The Council's counter-fraud strategy and framework underpins the Council's commitment to prevent all forms of fraud, bribery and corruption, whether it be attempted externally or from within, and progress against this is outlined within the annual report. The annual report is at Appendix 1, so I'll briefly highlight the key points within that report. So section one provides context. It outlines the impact of fraud within the public sector and the measures in place within Merthyr to try and mitigate that risk. Section two, which is on page 73 of the annual report, outlines the proactive work undertaken during the year. The agreed action plan is at Annex one, which details the progress made against each task. I would like to highlight that the fraud officer has and will continue to deliver fraud awareness sessions across directorates and has developed an awareness page on the intranet site. In addition, the Council's whistleblowing policy and a mandatory e-learning module has been launched to enable information to be provided confidentially. Section 3 on page 75 outlines the progress made with the National Fraud Initiative. This is a data matching exercise coordinated in Wales by Audit Wales. The matches are based on data extracted from council systems in October 2022, which was matched against data submitted from other bodies such as the local authorities, DWP, NHS bodies, police and housing associations. A total of 3,007 matches were received across housing benefit, council tax reduction, payroll, blue badges, creditors, licensing, etc. The number of matches reviewed by officers is quite low, with only 735 having been checked to date. From the review, 113 fraud or errors have been recorded, all of which relate to blue badge matches. However, there is no recoverable financial savings from these. This can be seen as a data cleansing exercise. However, projected savings have been calculated using a defined cabinet me office methodology, and that's in table one which predicts the potential or predicted loss if fraud or error had not been identified. This is not real money to the council and cannot be reflected in bottom line savings. And Annex 2 provides a summary of the cabinet office methodology for you to have a look at. The council receives single person discount matches annually. This is again through NFI. If it is determined that SPD is incorrectly claimed and applied, an adjustment is made to the account to recover the incorrect payment. It, the details of this are in Table 2, and £20,053 uh, has been recovered, and this is recoverable financial savings to the Council. Section 4 highlights the reactive fraud work that has been undertaken. These have been generated by referrals to internal audit by relevant managers throughout the authority. There were three matters reviewed during 2023-24, and these are detailed in Table 3. Section 5 gives examples of collaborative working. The Council also agreed to joint working with the DWP during 23-24, and protocols are being put in place. In addition, the Fraud Officer continues to work closely with the Council's 
uh, revenue and benefits team to identify and investigate all suspected cases of fraud. A corporate, for, a corporate fraud enforcement policy is being developed to support the implementation of sanctions, included, which will include those for welfare fraud. I think that's the highlights within the annual fraud, but I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Joan. A really helpful report, uh, setting out the work of the fraud officer. So just one, just one person, one, one full-time person. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> um, what what catches my eye is that there are savings to be made by recovery of. It says fraud and error. I suspect these are more errors than frauds, but we need to you know understand the difference. If they are frauds. Uh, then there's a potentially a prosecution, but if there's error, at least we recover the money. And as you say, table two shows that twenty thousand pound has been recovered. The, my feeling is there may well be more out there, and I understand the pressures on staff to do the work, to do the matches, to find some of the fraud and error. But it almost feels like something which is sort of would put would pay for itself. Um, so I'm kind of in, in, interested in sort of trying to work out. Is it capacity that's stopping us doing more with more matches, or is it sort of over they being prioritised and people think there's little opportunity to recover more money? I don't know, John, whether you have an insight into that. Thank you, Chair. Um, I think it's it's a mixture of both the matches. Most of the matches, over two thousand of them, are creditor matches. I understand there's been a lot of changes within the council with staffing within that section. Um, our corporate fraud officer, who is here today with us, um, she does support um, all all um, directorates without the, throughout the council with their matches. She offers advice and guidance, and in some cases sifts them to become just identify the higher risk ones. You're right; a lot of it is probably maybe data cleansing. So a match may be a match because the data is inaccurate. So again, addressing the matches in a timely manner will help inform the match uh, the data being extracted ready for the next match. So if it's not dealt with this year the chances are the same match may come up next year so so those matches will grow and grow and grow until data is cleansed i think that's a really helpful point joe because uh that, that's how duplicate payments get get made is there's the the creditor exists in two 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 versions and that makes it a lot harder to spot a duplicate payment when it's paid against two individual creditors who end up the same bank account potentially so i think there is something to be said for the benefits of of doing this work if only to cleanse the the data we've 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 got to make sure it is accurate um i don't know again it's a, it's unfair to turn to alice to look into the weeds or some somewhat but i wonder whether the, this there's something in here about sort of finding a resource and in terms of in, this is almost investor save isn't it because i think there's there's, there's benefit in having this Done. If only data cleansing is is helpful of itself, but certainly if we're identifying savings, then absolutely it should be worthwhile, shouldn't it? Yeah, I mean, I think you hit the nail on the head, Chair, earlier in your commentary. That I mean, if there's opportunities that we can um, just by want of a bit of resource go after, um, so there are actual conversion to savings there, uh, a more efficient uh, provision of service, then it definitely can be looked at as part of our troll in terms of all, all council opportunities. Um, and if there's a subsequent business case that can, we can make out of that, or potential better use of technology, um, then uh, we can certainly look at that. Okay, thank you. That, 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 that's helpful. La last commentary on the from from me on this one. At the back, there's on page 79, there's the Ford Action Plan, which it says at the top uh, 2021 to 24. Um, is, is this now, as, as part of the refresh, going to be developed into a new action plan? Noting that some of these carry forward. Yes, Chair. Um, the Ford strategy is due for refresh um, for twenty during twenty twenty four, and so therefore a new action plan will be developed and attached to the new Ford strategy. Okay, thank you, and uh, I, th I think the committee would appreciate the early sight of that as well when it's developed. Thank you, Councillor Tavi. I was just wondering. I think the probably the biggest source of fraud is the single person discount for council tax really because you just get your bill every year you tick the box saying you're living alone and it's very difficult to check up on it really uh, how do they go about trying to reduce fraud you know for the single person discount 
Thank you. Um, the, the biggest uh, match that we get is single person discounts against the electoral register. So they, they match to make sure that those households are single households according to the register and um, or if they're students, etc. living in, in there. So that's one of the biggest ways that they they pick up those things. Just to add to that, the NFI's a data matching exercise, as Joan, Joan referred to, uh, covering public sector organisations across the whole of the UK. So at the moment, there are just over 1,200 organisations involved in the data matching exercise, which means that our payroll could be matched to Newcastle's payroll. So there's a, there's a whole host of different matches that occur. Uh, I think we've got about, uh, looking at Nicole, um, 50 different lines of matches with payroll to creditors, payroll to payroll, housing benefits, single person discount to electoral register, um, a whole host of a variety of matches. So we collate our data, submit that to the cabinet office. Uh, they match it, send it back to us in January-ish time, and then we sift it because not every match is a, is a definite fraud. We prioritize that, and then we identify potential fraud which is looked into in a bit more detail. It's 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 just put as much information as you possibly can into a sausage machine, and 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 see where things come out that look like duplicates. They might well not be duplicates. Uh, you know, as I keep I keep saying, the example is me when I work for a bunch of different public sector bodies. I'll crop up on payroll of a bunch of different places. So I'll be a false positive because they say oh, he's working in two places at once. So um, those kind of examples exist, uh, yeah, of course. But it's it's the work that needs to be done then to actually review the the, the matches and see if they are actually fraud or error. And sometimes we give people the benefit of the doubt in terms of saying it's an error, and really sometimes it was absolutely deliberate. So uh, that's something we look at, isn't it? So thank you, thank you, Joan, for that. And I guess the the the, the pressure because it's a biannual, biennial, which is every two years <laughs> process. It'll come around again the next data match set, and uh, so it's 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 worth doing it to cleanse because the same matches the. If they are false positives, they will come up again next year if they don't get checked. So the benefit in doing that, absolutely. Thank you, everyone. Thank. You. That's a really helpful report, and uh, perhaps we're going to get some updates uh, on on what's happening through the year as well, particularly when we see the new plan. Home straight, I think. Uh, agenda item nine is the this committee's forward work program. Helen, is it you? Yep. Thank you, Chair. So agenda item nine is the Governance and Audit Committee Forward Work Programme, which is a report we bring to each meeting and ask members to approve. In order to assist the committee in ensuring that due consideration is given to all aspects of their core functions, the proposed Forward Work Programme for 24-25 is attached to Appendix A. The agenda items included within the Forward Work Programme are not set in stone and additional agenda items may be presented to committee throughout the year and the Forward Work Programme will be updated as necessary to reflect this. Shown on the table of paragraph 4.2 are the items scheduled to be presented at the next meeting scheduled uh, for September. There are nine items in total. Uh, the Annual Risk Management Report and Corporate Risk Register, Quarter one update on corporate risks, draft statement of accounts, including the draft annual governance statement. But I think yep. this is now just going to be the draft annual yep. governance statement. Audit Wales work programme and update, mm. the governance and audit committee self assessment against the SIPFA checklist, progress against the internal audit plan, internal audit recommendations, the committee forward work programme, and the issued internal audit uh, reports. Committee members are asked to endorse this schedule and confirm the list of officers they would like to invite for each item, if appropriate, and indicate whether any additional information or research is required. So at this point, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Chair. Thank, thank you, Helen. I've been persuaded off, as I said, uh, cancelling this, this meeting and rolling into November because I think there is a lot of work there. You're right to say that if the uh, the draft annual governor statement can come to us uh, separated from the accounts. 
uh, what I would like in the next meeting is a is a written update in terms of where we are with the accounts in terms of who's been appointed and who hasn't been appointed, and perhaps we can get to meet Barry as well. So that would be, that'll be helpful to have. And I think we've also said that we'll get another version of the external audit recommendations paper, there, which is agenda item seven today. We'll get another one of those at the next meeting as well. Uh, anything else missing off here that anyone else has any issues with? Oh, thank you. I didn't spot it. Councillor Scrivens. Yes, thank you, Chair. It was, uh, just to confirm, I'm happy with the with the work plan and happy to approve and give my support for that. Um, but just to let you know, I, I, I am going to have to leave now. I was meant to go on our bus. I tried to stick around till the <laughs> end, but I've got another meeting I've got to get to. Now we're very close to the end anyway, so thank you, Councillor Scrivens. Thank you. That's great. Thanks, Chair. OK, so are we happy to approve the work plan? With, so yeah, there was a couple of suggested amendments. I see some nods and nods and hands. Excellent, thank you. Uh, which takes us on to agenda item 10. And Helen, we stay with you for uh, the internal audit reports. Only two this time. Thank you, Chair. So yeah, agenda item 10 is the internal audit information reports. The purpose of this report is to inform members of this committee of the issued finalised internal audit reports for the period the 13th of April to the 9th of July. Copies of these reports have been provided to members in advance of today's meeting. And if members wish to review or consider these reports in more detail at a further future meeting, they are able to do so. Table 1 of paragraph 3.1 of the report shows that two internal audit reports have been finalised since the last committee. The table also shows for each of the reports the audit opinion, the number of recommendations made and whether these are high, medium or low priority. Uh, so finally, can I just take this opportunity to remind members that all internal audit reports are confidential. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Helen. And obviously, you were the eyes drawn to Table 1. And particularly the, the petty cash uh, audit, which has a limited assurance uh, opinion. Um, from your from your take, uh, Helen and the rest of the audit team, do you think well, so whilst it's a limited assurance opinion, have the recommendations been acted upon swiftly? And I, I, I trust a number of them would have been implemented by now. Am I right in taking that view? Uh, so, yeah, thank you, Chair. So we've received management comments in relation to the draft report, and I can confirm that a majority of them have been implemented or at least have an implementation date of the 30th of September. Um, these are uh, recommendations that we do monitor on part of our MK system, um, and we do pr uh, prepare reports and chase as necessary. Thank you. OK, so at, at this moment, does does anyone feel there's any need to take any further action or we'll wait and see what happens with regards to a follow-up, which will happen sometime after those dates are all finished? Yes, Chair, it will. Just to add to what um, <clears throat> Helen said, in terms of the petty cash, as it's limited assurance, a summary of why we felt it was limited will be reported into committee in due course. OK, that's really helpful as well. As well. Thank you. OK, uh, we will... Turn on to agenda item 11, evaluation and reflection. I think it was a very busy meeting today. I think there's been a lot of stuff going on. And, uh, um, thin, thin at the top sometimes. We're missing Councillor Barry today. And we're missing a Section 151 officer today. So poor old chief executive was had to do all the heavy lifting. I didn't, I didn't realise that was that was in the pay grade. <laughs> so other than that, thank you. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> and lastly, agenda item 12, there is no any other business. Therefore, I call the meeting to a close. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Chair.